We're here today, I'm Leslie Stokes with the Northern Miner, and Mining Clips is bringing back at the bar with Brent Cook and uh, Mickey Bulp. And this is something that has been on the go in the past, and I just wanted to ask Mickey, what's the story behind at the bar? Why is it important? Well, we used to do at the bar with a, with a different organization, and, and it was basically Brent and I talking about things about the exploration mining business and geology. We had a lot of fun, and so we thought it was so hugely popular, we decided we have to bring it back. So here we are at the bar, and it's time to <laughs> shed the necktie. We're done with the Cambridge House Conference. And uh, cheers, cheers yeah. folks. Yeah, salute. Let's talk all things geology and mining. And Brian, what do you what do you reckon? Oh, this is great. You know, we used to do this. Mickey, I've done, I've done this. Oh, probably ten cities across the Americas, and uh, it's it's a good a good place to learn what's going on, who's thinking what. And today we've got two people that are geologists. I think you both got a PhD. No, no, no. I just got a master's. She's she's smarter than me. No, I just spent longer at university. I'm not smarter. What's, what's the... I guess what I want to start out is with, from your perspective, I mean, you guys know the finance, banking, banking side, M&A side. Why is, why is it so tough in this industry now? Why, we, why is it so bad? What's the problem? Ladies first. Well, the easy answer is we've seen a significant reduction in prices of all commodities in U.S. dollar terms, essentially. And the outcome of that is obviously the commensurate reduction in equity prices. And it's an industry that at the worst times tends to make the bad decisions. This is a time when we should be thinking about the future. It's a time where you have a lot of good people around. You've got available resources in terms of whether it's drill rigs, experienced personnel, etc. And you've got valuations that are arguably the lowest they've been in the last 10 years. So I would consider it's a really interesting time. That sounds like a really contrarian point of view, and I'm a contrarian. I'd be interested to know what Joe says about that. I want, to hear, I want to hear about the bad decisions part. What the hell is that? Made? Yeah, how's that happen? <laughs> I made a few. No, no, in the industry, it's not like the, the bankers, the brokers, the CEOs, why are so many bad decisions made? I mean, come on. Well, I mean, uh, part of it's momentum. You get, you get told to do one thing and you do it, and in the old cycle, I mean, it's a cyclical industry, and growth is a big part of it, and was a big part of it. The big difference between marginal cost industries and gold was that the marginal cost industries like copper, which I worked in, they would care about costs, and gold would only care about production. They'd only care about growth. They wouldn't care about return. And they rode that for about seven years, and now they're paying for it. And now they're starting to get, like as Brent has said before, religion about getting return. And that's a completely different notion for them. And it involves a lot of pain in terms of impairments, in terms of write downs, in terms of growth. And now you look at assets differently, what you're already producing and what you would buy. So I'll, add, I'll, I'll chime in on that. And Joe brings up a very good point is the gold mining companies are especially egregious in this, in the fact that they were focused on growth, on what I call a Wall Street style of capitalism, growth for growth's sake, uh, quarterly earnings, and mining as a business, in my opinion, is a value industry, not a growth industry. Now that the companies are gonna start focusing on value, maybe for the first time, since the bull market for gold started in 2003, maybe we'll see some reward to shareholders. Well, okay, but yeah, right. But what happens when yeah. gold hits 1,500 bucks? I think that well, all this religion goes down the drain again. Everybody's making money, right? Well, your point's well taken. Maybe, but if, you know what Einstein said about the definition of insanity is you make the same mistakes over and over again. We'll see what happens with the gold miners. But wouldn't you argue that every cycle we've made the same mistakes yeah. over and over again? In a bull market, everybody's a genius. Absolutely. And I think that a lot of us mistake the difference between having a good underlying stock pick, i.e. an alpha pick versus the beta, that is the stock price movement in link with the underlying commodity price. 
And I think one thing that we saw that's very different this cycle than, say, the previous cycle is there was a huge amount of investor demand for growth. And as you said, very succinctly and very well, growth for growth's sake at any cost. And gold companies got to do that because no one ever expected them to produce free cash. And now gold companies live in this horrifying world where they have to actually produce free cash and they never had to do that before. But what you saw them do is the easiest way to grow the ounces on your book is to change the price at which you calculate your reserves. That means that your reserve grade goes down, your operating cost goes up, and yes, your profile goes up and your reserve base goes up, but your ability to generate free cash goes down. And we're seeing the, the outcome of that because we've had very few decent discoveries over the last 10 years. Well, not only that, but from a study that I did with Cypher Research a few months ago, we showed that the seven largest gold miners in the world use equity raises and debt to pay dividends to their shareholders. So they were really not generating free cash flow on the books they showed it as, but if you do what we call the adequacy ratio, it didn't work. So how do you juxtapose, juxtapose investor demand, as in investors demanding growth, and investors having, if you're lucky, a quarterly time horizon in the sense of, versus a company that has to build its business for the next 10 years? And we saw, we saw investors crying out for growth and we saw companies responding to that that initially had a short-term gain in their share price, but they're paying for that now. So whose fault is it? Yeah. Well, it's everybody's fault. It's, it's, it's the, but number one, it's the gold companies because they created a, a paradigm of growth for growth's sake. So the, my point would be that a well-run gold company would come to its shareholders and say we're not growing because we value our business we want to be a we want to reward our shareholders in the long term with dividends from free cash flow yeah. without taking on more debt and more equity yeah so what do what do you think Joe well the problem with with, with that argument is that these guys uh, go and visit all their biggest shareholders and their shareholders will tell them what they want and then it comes back to the CEO, the management, and the board to say what they can do. The, the problem in the industry was that it, it's not just the companies, it's not just the brokerage firms, it's not just all that, it's not just the investment funds. It, it was, I don't want to say conspiratorial because that takes a lot more thinking and it takes a lot more collusion. It was a, it was collusion. It's no, like, no, I, I, no, no, I, I, I don't believe in conspiracy theories because it takes a lot more people to talk. And all I know is that communication is crap. The thing is, all I want to say is that we would go and we would be forced to think one way. So if I hear 10 people saying, and I look through everything for a company I worked for, which was a major gold producer, what the investors actually said. And it was not gold at any cost, it was GARP. It was gold at reasonable price. But what's the price? We were thinking 13, 1400, like when I started with one major company, our business plan price was 500, or 350, sorry. And then when I left, it was like 700. Did our assets get any better? No, we took stuff that didn't make any sense and tried to make it make sense. And then when we came out of it and then we lowered the gold price, suddenly everything NPV wise didn't make any sense. We weren't generating any return because we were only interested in generating NPV dollars, not IRR. And now the industry is asking for something completely different that we're not geared for and we're slowly getting geared for. Uh, what, do you, what, what, what do you think? Well, I, think I think it's a big mistake, uh, a company basing their, their long-term future based on what investors want that quarter. I mean, that's like, Absolutely. you know, that's like uh, trying to figure out, trying to cater yourself to what Trump supporters would want, right? I mean, it makes absolutely no sense, right? Mickey? <laughs> well, you know, I... I, I got to get my... Hey, <laughs> thanks for throwing... Okay, so thanks for throwing that back to me, and I would you say... You need to pay I, right I would say that I, I don't intend to vote for either Trump the Chump or Billy as a libertarian, a hardcore libertarian. You know, I probably subscribe to the P.J. O'Rourke thesis of don't vote, it only encourages the bastards. But that said... 
the entire business has been on a what have you done for me lately business or idea and I don't think that the mining business is suited for that. I think if you create a gold mining company that bucks the crowd and says we're going to reward our shareholders, we're going to mine uh, ounces of value that contribute to our free cash flow, we're going to pay dividends and reward our shareholders, that eventually investors will choose that particular gold company. And I, I would argue there's a, a few and not many companies out there that have done exactly as you've said. Grand Gold and... Grand Gold. Grand Gold. And, and the, well, the second... Well, uh, here, I'll, I'll chime in on the second one. In, in our study of seven major gold miners, there are two companies that stand out in particular who have not focused on building resources and reserves that will never be mined. And number one, that's Rangold. And number two, it's Newmont. Take a look at Newmont. And I'm not here to promote Newmont, but Newmont has, not, has run their business over the last two or three years in a way that makes sense to me. But, but I, I would argue that the response that we've seen over the last 15 years is, is very rational. In a bull market, everybody wants talk. They want high beta names, which means high beta generally equals lower quality ounces, simplistically. Yeah. And then in a bear market, people care about free cash. And so we're very focused survival on this mode. and survival. And we're very focused on this concept of free cash today because we're in an environment where there's a significant amount of volatility in the underlying price. None of us know what will happen with the gold price. So we're concerned, we've experienced four years of pain if you've been long gold equities or pretty much any equity. And so there's a focus on protection. In a bull market, no one will give a crap about any of that. They want ounces for ounces sake again, I think. I agree. What I would say is that we saw back in 11 that when the gold price was going up, the equities didn't react. We saw low betas as people dumped the equities and bought gold because they weren't producing what they wanted to produce in terms of free cash flow, in terms of yield, and they dumped the equities and people just bought gold. They didn't buy gold, they bought paper gold. They yeah. did not buy physical. Yeah. They, and so, and so yeah. that's another yeah. part of the business that well, we have. What I want to say is that now over the last, let's say, six to nine months, we've been seeing the betas react much better. We've been seeing the gold companies react much better to small movements in gold price, such that it sort of indicates the interest is there and they will pick the right companies. And so even in this market environment where you get a low gold price environment, you'll still see some people trading at a premium because 5% of the market will take all the funding. The 95% won't have nothing. So with, with these gold companies, I know I know we're, we're talking about the conditions and everything, and we mentioned Newmont and Rangold. What are some of your other companies that you guys have your eyes on this year? Brent, do you want to? Well, you know, I, I, Joe's joined me at Exploration Insights. I'm pretty positive looking forward. Joe's got a really good handle on on development and you know mid-tier gold producers, and I think that's the place that offers probably the safest um, upside and lowest risk. And that's kind of where I'm putting probably a third of my money or half my money. The other half I'm, I'm saving for exploration stories and that. And and you know we're talking about how these guys are lowering their gold their their costs, and and there's efficiencies they're getting around, but. They're really cutting back on development. And they're seriously cutting back on exploration, and this is what's going to bite them in the ass. Come, yeah. come, few years down the road, and that's when we're really going to make money because we're going to own the stocks, the only companies that are left that are actually capable of finding something or have something. So that's, you know, that's that's what I'm excited about. How about we wrap this version, this segment of at the bar, and we'll meet again at PDAC in Toronto. Uh, in what six weeks and do this again now here we go thanks guys thanks for coming thank you thank you